Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to talk, I think we're going to range quite widely into the ancient Roman world. But Mary, tell us about 12 Caesars, because it's not just about ancient Rome, it's about the legacies of Rome in art and cultural forms. Yeah. Um, Who are the 12 Caesars? Yeah, let's, let's start Go from, from the, the beginning. beginning. 12, Who, yeah. 12 Caesars, I took the title from a much more famous book than mine, which is Suetonius's biographies of written in the second century CE, of the emperors from Julius Caesar to Domitian, 12 of them. Um, Julius Caesar assassinated in 44, Domitian assassinated in 96 CE. So it's a kind of, you know, 140 years of um, abuse and abuse of power through 12 emperors. Um, and I chose to write about them particularly through the, the, the lens of visual arts and through the lens of modern art as much as ancient art, partly because um, we've got so bored by them, right? I mean, if you go to a museum or an art gallery and there's a lineup of busts of emperors, you know, on a shelf down one side of a corridor, you can guarantee that nobody stops. I mean, we've become, we think of them as, you know, conservative badges of power, um, recreated in the modern world for dictators, dynasts, Mussolini, you name it, and we just want to leave them behind. So the idea of the book was to say, look, can we make these images interesting again? You know, there are more images of emperors, Roman emperors, in the West um, than of anybody, with the exception, I think, of Jesus Christ and a few saints. You know, they are everywhere. They're still in our field of vision. What can we say about them other than simply to yawn and walk by? And so that was, that was the project. <laughs> Uh, why are they everywhere? Why is it that 2,000 years later we know these 12 dead men? Most, I mean, in fact, it'd be interesting if, we, if, we, if we're on the sandbank this evening and don't do well in the quiz, maybe we can name those 12, because some are very <laughs> famous and some Domitian not very famous, apart from his flies. No, apart <laughs> from his flies. Domitian's, um, according to Suetonius, Domitian's um, pastime was uh, torturing flies with his pen nib, right? Which is what he did when he was alone and bored. Stillness, I, stillness. stillness. That's what he did for stillness. Yes. <laughs> but why, why, well, why that, are these 12 guys, 2,000 years? That is right. the interesting question because, you know, if you it, casually amongst ancient historians, modern historians, you know, people would say, look, um, they represent um, a, a, cons a relatively conservative badge of power, right? They, they provide role models or um, an image of success for uh, the powerful in the modern world, all nicely arranged for you um, through Suetonius's um, nice 12. It's, a, it's got a neat, a neat system of power. Now, I think the problem about that is that you, know, you didn't have to know much Roman history to know that most of them came to a dead, nasty end. So the idea that uh, the, the Gonzaga at Mantua or King Charles I in England, the idea that he didn't realise that he was decorating his estate with images of people who were largely, according to the standard view, largely assassinated, is something I think you've got to take on board. You know, it's... Uh, it's jolly odd to have, uh, you know, pictures of Nero, Caligula, Domitian. There's not a single emperor amongst those 12 for whom there has not been some allegation that he was murdered. Right. So, in some ways, what I, I came to think that part of what was interesting about these guys was not that... They were the successful continuators of dynasty and power, et cetera, et cetera. But in a sense, they were representing 
a, the the very vulnerable underbelly of monarchy. I mean, I, you know, I'm a, a paid-up Republican in many ways, but when I was writing this book, I became more sympathetic to these ordinary guys who were one-man rulers, you know, trying to work out how to do it, where there was uh, a, a, any kind of template for that. And I think they were, in a sense, talking much more sophisticatedly about power than we give them credit for. I mean, the classic example would be um, the set of paintings now in Hampton Court, but originally in Mantua, um, of uh, Mantegna's paintings of the triumphs of Caesar. It's a triumphal procession full of the triumphal loot, the prisoners, the cheering troops uh, for Caesar's triumph, which he celebrated in 45. The a series of paintings, eight or nine of them, and in the last image, there is Caesar actually on his triumphal chariot. And these paintings have always been hyped as you know, the celebration of Roman and then later military monarchic might. Again, you don't have to know much Roman history to know that within six months of this celebration, Caesar was dead, right? And in a way, you look at that figure of Julius Caesar bringing up the rear of this splendid procession, and he's gaunt and worried and, uh, in a sense, questioning the nature of what has gone before. Uh, and I think that, in some ways... These, you know, in, may, look, in many ways, you know, Charles I buys these paintings. He's not a very nice guy. Um, but he does have some sense of um, the problematics of monarchy. And I think that that's what's going on. And it's interesting, when Charles I is overthrown and Oliver Cromwell um, takes over with a kind of mini bit of republicanism in England. Um, Oliver Cromwell sells most of Charles I's art collection. One thing he doesn't sell is these paintings of Caesar and his triumphal procession, because in a sense, Cromwell got the point, I think. So I'm being a bit more generous. Or hate these monarchs as I do, I'm still giving them a bit more of the benefit of the doubt. There we go. Um, so interesting on that, the ambiguity of these Roman emperors, how they're being received. And I'd like to just stick on, on the Rome after Rome and how it's being interpreted. Tell us a bit about the attraction. I know your new book is about emperors specifically. How is the modula, how is this scene, the difference between the Roman Empire as a model that colonial worlds want to adopt and therefore excite rather than these individuals? Does it really matter who these 12 Caesars are? Um. It both does and doesn't. Um, and, and I think that's part of the attraction of this, that you can come in and out with your lens. You can do the Roman Empire, right? Uh, and think that it doesn't matter very much who the guy on the throne is. But you're given enough material in which to play around with individual character. Now, I don't think that individual character is particularly important uh, amongst Roman emperors. I think Roman emperors, uh, we, like Suetonius, was, you know, get fixated on, you know, the murderous psychopaths, the, you know, the feckless teenagers, the diligent bureaucrats. They're much more like one another than they are different. But nevertheless, you've got this, um, you've got the lure of perhaps um, seeing individuals. And I think that, that it, it's the the big picture and the little picture, you know, it's the person and the individual versus the system that's always quite exciting. And the, and the co-opting of figures, you know, Mark Zuckerberg famously sort of admires Augustus more than anyone else. I mean, t tell us, uh, how does a classicist understand? <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, how does... Yeah. Um, I'm, I mean, I think it is extremely interesting that, that in some ways in... Um, popular political culture, the individuals have tended to win out. Um, it was always said that um, Bill Clinton had the meditations of Marcus Aurelius 
uh, on his bedside table. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. I'm, I'm not going to ask whether you think Mr. Clinton uh, has. Uh, whether Bill Clinton had or whether the hundreds of thousands of people who still buy these meditations have, God only knows. But I mean, I think um, Peter probably is well aware, like me, that if you do that awful, awfully thing and you occasionally check your ratings on Amazon, what you'll find is, for, well, I normally find that Marcus Aurelius is still out selling me, um, which I think is a I'm, I'm never quite sure whether I'm pleased. If, if you want to feel better, Mary, my book on the First Crusade is the number one ranked book about the history of Japan <laughs> at the moment. So these ratings are not always absolutely reliable. I, I think that's true, but there, it is also quite a good way of pulling you down a peg or two, isn't it? You know, thinking that you know, 2,000 years on, Marcus Aurelius is still outselling us in, with, a, with, a, with a book that is frankly incomprehensible, if not platitudinous, you know. Always think of the future, right? Well, you didn't need a Roman emperor to tell you that, right? It's kind of the worst sort of self-help manual that there is. Um, but still, I, still, it's not about stillness. It's all about stillness. <laughs> you know, I think Marcus Aurelius was... When he wasn't butchering barbarians, he was really into stillness, I think. Um, but <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, it is a kind of way of... It's, it's that wanting. You know, why does Bill Clinton like this? Because it is that sexiness of this is what a Roman emperor actually said. And I think although I'm very kind of, um, you know, I, I don't much like that sort of um, often rather lurid biographical tradition about emperors. You know, what did Tiberius really do in the swimming pool, etc.? I don't like that much. Uh, I think that... One has to take on board that sense that people are understandably, like me, attracted by that sort of individualism. And, you know, I, to some extent, I think you have to say, look, it is absolutely bloody amazing that we can still read a book, even if it is a load of trite platitudes, we can still read a book written by a Roman emperor who died 2,000 years ago. We can read... Julius Caesar's account of his butchery in Gaul. You know? We can read the Emperor Augustus's account of what I did that he put up outside his tomb. You know, there's something that the Roman Empire is still pretty, you know, you can get surprisingly close to it. There's a word you didn't say just then, so I'm slightly putting words in your mouth, Mary, but very male. You needn't worry, Peter. It is very male, and that's you know. And you think, why is a feminist like me working on um, this on all these blokes? Um, well, partly because I think it needs a woman to work on them, um, because I think she sees things differently. Um, but also, in all the stuff I've been doing recently about Roman emperors, I, you know, I've not been trying to give as much space to the women because I think that's, that's impossible without fantasy. But I am trying always to think how the women get written out of this story. And I think that's, that's the important thing to do. I don't think it's, you know, I don't want to turn Augustus's wife, Livia, into, you know, a misunderstood um, a philanthropic matriarch, which some people try to do. Um, I want to try to understand why she's written about as she is and, and why ultimately she gets written out. And you know, I think that I think it's sometimes quite good for women to take on blokey subjects. You know, I think more women should do military history because I think it would be a lot less jingoistic if they did. I mean, that, that's, I mean of, of course, that's absolutely right. But that, that's one side of it about you as a, as a woman scholar looking at the ideas about gender, but in terms of the reception of what's been picked out of Rome, it is the military, it's the martial, it's the autocratic, it's where women and mothers and sisters and daughters have uh, grotesque roles rather than ones of importance. Is the, is, is the framing of history and the readoption of the classical world, does it, does, it, is it, does it provide a straitjacket that locks you in? I'm, I'm not sure you're right about that. I think it's about what we choose to look at in the reception okay. of the classical world. I and mean, I think what, one of the um, 
uh, gross oversimplifications about the empire in general, the Roman Empire in general, is that it provided a template for the British Empire. Now, up to a point, it did. And you can pick out you know, any number of imperialist bastards and show that they read classics at Oxford or Cambridge. And that is true. Uh, what we tend to forget is that the people who were opposing the British Empire are uh, in the time of the empire, and there were plenty of those writing diligently for the Manchester Guardian, they'd also read classics at Oxford and Cambridge. And uh, we, we've come, I think, a bit too self-flagellating about our investment in the Roman Empire. We have come to see it solely as a legitimation of some of the you know, awful blots on the British conscience. And sure, it is that. And you know, sure, Mussolini... Uh, you know, m made a huge thing about um, Augustus as a, as a template for his dictatorship. But we forget that Antonio Gramsci was at the same time saying that every child should learn Latin, you know. Uh, and in the history of political debate, you will find classics and the history of the Roman Empire being deployed on all sides of the argument, not just on one side side of the argument. And if you say, um, well, yeah, but, you know, go down those galleries and, you know, what do you see when you see the ways that the Roman Empire has been represented to us? Well, it's true, you see these utterly boring lineup of one look -alike bloody bust after the next, you know, in yet more vulgar materials, you know, gold and porphyry or whatever. But there are painters uh, and sculptors, sculptors also using a female lens onto the Roman Empire to try to see its, weak, its weaknesses and its edginess and its discontents. I mean, one of the most uh, notable discoveries that I made when I was writing the, the arty book um, was... Uh, the work of Edmonia Lewis, the first professional black American sculptor who creates an extraordinary over-life-size image of Cleopatra, which is displayed in one of the world's fairs in the late 19th century. And you know, the, the fate of that sculpture you know, tells you everything in a way, because Lewis, who was subject to extraordinary racism in the United States, eventually settles in Rome, where she does this Cleopatra. She ships it back to uh, the Chicago World's Fair. Um, but it's frankly too pricey for her to ship back to Rome again. So she kind of abandons it. And it then gets lost. And it's eventually found on a Chicago race course marking the grave of a racehorse called Cleopatra. Um, and it's now in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So, you, you know, you see that uh, here you have got all these interventions by women and about the women in the Roman imperial story. Um, but often we choose not to see them or not to notice them or not to prize them. But in a way, that's changing. And it's great to see Edmonia Lewis, you know, as black American sculptor with her Cleopatra over life size, really towering at you in the American Art Museum now. And, and restored. What, tell, us, tell us about, about what emperors actually are, Mary. I mean, one of the, one of the um, great jaw-dropping lines you have at the beginning of your new book that is coming out in... The summer? September. 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 Is, uh, most people in the Roman Empire couldn't name the emperor. <laughs> yes, I think, I, mean, I, I think that there's quite a lot of things in the new book which should reassure everybody who is always a bit worried about their grip on the Roman Empire. Right. Um, you know, because, you know, as Peter said before, there are some you know, terribly well-known household names amongst the Roman emperors. You know, there's hardly a person, really, who can't sort of have a glimmer of recognition for Nero or Julius Caesar, right? Um, but, you know, you said Domitian wasn't very well-known. Well, you know, I'd like to ask you all to write down on a piece of paper what you know about Didius Julianus, right? 
193 AD CE, I'll give you a clue. Uh, we don't, you know, a lot of them have been lost, really, to modern culture. No, Didius Julianus is not the subject of many paintings, you know, in the modern world. But I think that one of the things that I find quite cheering is that it's absolutely clear that some people in Rome, yeah, they, it would matter who the emperor was. They'd be able to name him. They'd see him. They'd go to the Colosseum and they would, they would witness him, albeit from a distance. But the lower down the social hierarchy and the further away from Rome you go, um, you simply, you're seeing people who clearly have no real clue. They know there's an emperor, but they don't know who it is. They might possibly, if they've got a coin, look at the head, but I think not in any very kind of analytical way. And there's one frightfully kind of patronising um, uh, bishop in North Africa in late antiquity who says that as far as he can see, most of his congregation still think that Agamemnon was on the throne, the mythical Greek um, hero of the Trojan War. And you, you come across, oh, there's a wonderful papyrus list that some real academic nerd has tried to compile in Roman Egypt, listing the emperors and how long they reigned for. And he gets, them, half of them are wrong, you know. He kind of misses out Caligula. He doubles up the length of Antoninus Pius's reign and misses out Marcus Aurelius. So, and, and this guy's got very nice handwriting and is clearly trying to be very, very precise about getting you know, the sequence of power right, and he doesn't do it. So in, in some ways, it's that which makes me think, and which, unlike the, the book which came out last year, but... Uh, in the new book, I'm trying to think not about... I, I mean, I love the anecdotes about Roman emperors, but I'm not trying to pin them too carefully onto one individual emperor. I'm thinking about what do people think in the Roman Empire the emperor does. And there's just one thing I would add to that kind of in my favour... Um, when people think, oh, God, this is going to be a rather dull book without individuals. Um, uh, what I would point out is, you know, we do all get dead interested in the weird and wonderful stories about Roman emperors. And, there's, and we, we think of them as being hugely individualistic. And so uh, one of the favourite ones is the idea that Caligula, once upon a time, um, thought he would make his favourite racehorse a consul. And people think, God, that is a real sign of the complete madness of this guy. Um, if you look through what's said about a whole load of other emperors up to the 3rd century AD, you, what you discover is that an awful lot of them have um, rather dubious relationships with their horses, right? You know, and they're always doing things. Like, I mean, Caligula's the only one that makes them a consul threatens to make his horse a consul, but others do things like painting their hooves gold, you know, and sending them, you know, posh dinners to eat or inviting them to the palace to join in the banquet. So, you know, what I've, I've come to see is that that idea of getting your relationship with your horse wrong is an absolute characteristic, not of Caligula, but of Roman imperial power gone wrong. So tell us about uh, Elagabalus, even though he's not one of your 12. Um, but he, the way in which he's described his reign, how much of that is real? How do we... How do we I mean, because it's the art of being a historian, being able to judge what's actually going on rather than what you're told. Well, Elagabalus is another not-household name, right? We're trying our best. Well, he's got an opera named after him, isn't he? Trying to, we're trying our best. Um, uh, but he's... He, in the ancient literary tradition, is someone who makes the Emperor Nero look like a pussycat, really. Um, he has all kinds of, um, uh, well, at best, faux pas uh, loaded up against him. So one day he invites his guests to a posh dinner uh, and he showers them with rose petals, but so many that they smother and die. 
um, he invents the whoopee cushion. Uh, so he, invent, he invites a load of um, rather posh senators to dinner, puts them on inflatable cushions, and has the slaves go round through the dinner, letting the air out. So in the end, they end up on the floor. Right? Um, you know, you name it. He, tr he tries, and it's been quite interesting in, in terms of modern debates, uh, he uh, is alleged to have tried to have a surgical transition that he, um, he wants to become a woman, and he gets his doctors to do that for him. It's said. It is said. And, I mean, I think that when most people look at Ella Gabalus, they either try to say, none of that can be true, right? Or they say, wow, you know, this is, you know, this is really kind of, this is Roman imperial power at its absolute well, he, he was a teenage boy as well. Oh, like, he was that's a what, that's oh, my... Yeah, they're teenagers. And he's, they're... Not, and he's not allowed for long. No, four years. <laughs> right. And he marries a Vestal Virgin. I mean, n name any Roman crime yeah. and Elagabalus committed it. He's done it. Basically. Um, he's Syrian, so there is a kind of sense of in what sense is Elagabalus foreign, in what sense is he Roman, what does it mean to be Roman in the third century CE. But I think people have got so bogged down with, could any of this be true? You know, and, and haven't actually thought, what is this kind of, te what are these anecdotes? Let's not imagine that they're true in literal terms, but let's imagine that they're true, symbolically true. They, they're certainly telling us something about how Romans conceptualized imperial power. And you know, just that uh, anecdote about the falling rose petals that smother the guests so they die. Um, and it, what that's telling you is that imperial generosity is really dangerous. That when emperors are generous, even then they kill you. You, know, you cannot be the controller, the ruler of the world, and be generous in the way that you or I can be generous, you, your generosity always risks the lives of the people that you are being generous to. And m many of the anecdotes are also about how the Roman emperor turns the world upside down. That, you know, Elagabalus, he never eats fish when he's near the sea. He only eats fish when he's inland. Um, he has... Um, his uh, ice pits full of snow in the summer, not in the winter, and he, uh, he works by night and he sleeps by day. And you see all kinds of people kind of writing this out, either to say, that can't possibly be true, or whatever. But at, at a meta level, what's, what's happening is that it's telling us that emperors create a dystopian world in which the natural order of things is upset. And I think that's probably what's happening in the stories of his transition. Well, t tell us about that, Mary. I mean, that, that's the first time that I went to a, a lecture you gave in Cambridge uh, more years ago than either of us probably care to remember. But what is it that that emperor, what is it the emperor does? And so does it matter outside the corridors of power? Being an emperor is, is dangerous for everybody around. Um, how, do, how does an emperor control a great empire? Yes. Um, well, that's, the, that's another you know, big question. I mean, the, one of the things about the Roman Empire, which people tend to acknowledge and then pass on, is that it is ruling, quotes, the Roman Empire, uh, with something like uh, a one senior official for every third of a million inhabitants of the empire. Uh, and it makes even the kind of relatively low level of boots on the ground, civilian boots on the ground, of the British Empire look well stocked. Right? And it's a vast empire before there is any modern means of communication. So how does he, how does he do it? Well, in part, I think he doesn't. Or at least, I think the Roman Emperor and the Roman Emperor's staff have very low expectations of what, of, what they, of what they're looking for in the empire. They want 
taxes to come in. They need the taxes and they don't want trouble. And after that, with a kind of few bits of um, perils about Christianity, which would come under, in my view, don't want trouble, um, they are happy to let things be. And it's a classic bit of imperialism, which you can find mirrored elsewhere, of it is an empire that works by collaboration. You know, it works by collaboration in Rome, because although we have an image uh, of all the old elite, the Senate, being somehow in deep hostility to the emperor, most of them are getting on and helping the emperor. I mean, it's, a, it's an emperor, a, empire in the centre in which the elite is collaborating. The further you go out, the local elites are collaborating. They're delivering the taxes, um, some of which are levied much as they had been before. But on top of that, there's a kind of superstructure which reminds you, symbolically, constantly reminds you that there is an emperor. So that, in some ways, is the function of the head on the coinage. You, know, you cannot be involved in commercial transactions in the Roman Empire without seeing uh, the ruler's head. Um, and you see kind of the beginnings of globalizing style. So, you know, you shove, you know, Britain is about the most benighted, hopeless, backward province of the Roman Empire that there was. The only province in the Roman world from which no senator ever emerged. But even there, you get, you get the triumphal arch, the big, the, the, the kind of, or the Hadrian's Ward, you get um, material and symbolic signs of control, but you've never actually conquered the province. And there's a, then presumably, and it's grist to my mill, is that that structure is fundamentally weak. And so under the pressure of the fourth century and the collapse of the Western Empire or the Western provinces, the tissues that hold it up are so loose that actually it doesn't take much for, the, for, the, for, the, for, for everything to sag and then suddenly people don't travel more than five miles yeah. from their homes. Yeah, well, you, I mean, you can see it two ways. I mean, I, I tend to see it saying, blimey, for 400 years it worked. Yeah. You know, and you know, the question is, what is it then? What is the tipping point? So, I mean, you're right. Once it ceases to work, um, then you get almost instant implosion. Yeah. But uh, for a, a, a system which has very little system, it actually goes along for several centuries, not changing very much. I mean, I think that the, one of the reasons that I decided to in the book that's coming out in September, is to kind of start with Julius Caesar, you know, and end a little bit after Elagabalus in the middle of the third century CE, is that in all kinds of ways, nothing happens between the death of Caesar and the death of, of Elagabalus' successor, Alexander. Um, you know, an old colleague of mine used to say, um, uh, you could go to sleep in... 1 BCE and wake up in 201 CE and you know, things would have changed a bit. Well, the calendar. Well, you're, you're, you're in a new millennium. Well, Sorry. I, didn't I make couldn't it. help. Couldn't help myself. Don't ignore me. Uh, ignore him. Ignore him. You know, a, a good pagan Roman would, would, wake, would wake up and nothing much had changed. You know, you'd have been able to get out of bed and go about a life as before. Of course, there are some differences. Um, and by 201 CE, uh, Christianity is a bigger, not a huge, but a bigger mark uh, on the landscape. Uh, you couldn't wake up in... 301 BC, CE, you couldn't wake up 300 years later and still recognize things. You know, and so there, there really is a change in the third century, which means that the kind of people who become emperors um, are very different. The way the Roman Empire is articulated, where it's run from, who's doing it, becomes different. But I think it's absolutely gobsmacking that it somehow, Augustus, improvises a system, he improvises a name, he improvises a role um, for one-man rule, which, which works for, you know, a, cu a couple of, of centuries. And that, you know, we get preoccupied by, you know, little bits of conquest. You know, Britain was conquered, well, you know, made 
a bugger of a difference to the basic pattern of the Roman Empire. And some of the most hyped victories, like Trajan's victories over Dacia and Parthia, you know, Trajan's column, uh, gives uh, uh, the impression of, you know, major expansion in the Roman Empire. Well, his conquest of Parthia was held for about six months, and even Dacia didn't last a century. And one, one more question, and then we have some questions um, from the audience. But just, to, just on that question about fluidity and the looseness of institutions, I mean, talk us through about just a, a sort of final firework of brilliance about identity in Rome. I mean, the, the different languages that are used, Greek, Palmyrene, yeah. all these sort of the fluidity yeah. that yeah. what it means to be Roman is so loose yeah. that you can say, well, you've got coins and you've got some yeah. guy who lives in yeah. Rome who's obviously yeah. grand and famous. What does, being, what, does, what, do, what, do, what does being Roman mean before the yeah. third century? God only knows, really. I mean, what I, I think that's the big puzzle uh, because you can see that um, there is extraordinary diversity cultural diversity within the Roman Empire. There's many different languages spoken. There are many different little local power nexuses. There are different ways of displaying um, your own identity, which is both Roman and where you come from. Now, I think Rome has got, you know, I don't think it has many lessons for us, but one of the lessons it has is the idea that you can um, be both Roman and Greek. You can you can, you can have, as um, one poet was said to have had in, in the second century BC, you can have three hearts. You know, you can belong to different places. And quite how that works, I think, is very unclear to us. And it's certainly not um, a, a nice kind of lovey um, bit of, you know, cultural sort of understanding because at the same time as the Romans are celebrating individually their their different versions of themselves and their different identities and Hadrian is becoming a city of, a citizen of Athens as well as of Rome etc you know at the same time they're being absolutely foul to foreigners um, within the empire um, and outside it and Septimius Severus for example who's often the poster boy of uh, cultural divergence and diversity in the Roman Empire because he's the first emperor to come from the continent of Africa. Um, they mock his diet because it's kind of all sort of African working class. And when his sister or his cousin comes over to Rome, she speaks with such a terrible accent, African accent, that he sends her straight back, so it is said. So you have this, you, you have the coexistence of tolerance, diversity, and appalling prejudice. And we just don't know how it works. I mean, the, 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 the one example that I think is always wonderfully puzzling is uh, the tombstone found near Hadrian's Wall of a woman who had been a slave called Regina, Queenie. She comes from Essex. Uh, so she's an Essex girl called Queenie. Um, and she is buried in the Roman fort at South Shields. And she's buried by her husband, Barates, who comes from Palmyra. And part of her tombstone is written in Latin. There is then a line of Aramaic at the bottom, and there is a portrait sculpture of Queenie making her look like a Palmyrene matron. And it, it, it is often now the kind of... it is. Yeah, an, another bit of poster boying for um, cultural diversity, you know, even in the outposts of Roman Britain. What we have no idea of is whether Queenie and Barates were kind of totally accepted in South Shields, whether when they walked through the streets, people said, God, that's that odd couple. Um, what language they spoke at home, where Barates found someone in South Shields who could write out on a tombstone very nicely a nice bit of Aramaic. And as soon as you push behind it, you simply don't know what the, what the infrastructure is. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's have a couple of questions before lunch. If you put your hands up. Maybe, maybe if there are a couple, we'll be doing both together. Um, or... 
given... I came a long way for no questions. Uh, well, you'll be performing over. I mean, you're performing. You'll be you'll be at lunch, able to answer. <laughs> oh, look, there's like, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, William. Do you have a favourite emperor? I think they're all horrible. <laughs> um, even, and the, I think the worst are the ones that get a good press. You know, imagine sitting down for a dinner with Claudius. You know, Claudius has come down to us actually through Robert Graves as being a sort of sweetie academic who um, was quite clever inside. They're, the, they're uh, the worst of the lot, aren't they? He is the, absolutely ghastly. And if you look at the total that Suetonius comes out with for Claudius, a number of people put to death, you know, he far outweighs, you know, the apparent monsters of Nero and Caligula. So um, keep, me, keep me well away from the good ones, I think. That's my Anyone else for a final? Yes, Vikas. Mary, now you are a professor of the classics, but increasingly we are seeing moves to defund the liberal arts. And of course, classics will be the first thing affected because they'll say, why the hell do we need to know about these ancient Roman emperors and things like that? What is your view about this, you know, especially in America, the liberal arts are being defunded, yeah. universities are saying we are closing down those courses. Uh, I think that's true, and I think it's worrying. I think it's exaggerated. I was talking quite recently at University of Chicago and looking at um, a whole series of articles that have recently come out about the death of the humanities uh, in the United States. And I, I think there is a bit of overhand ringing about it. I, I don't think there's nothing to be worried about. I think there is something to be worried about. But people who teach the humanities have got a very long tradition of saying how that no one wants to fund them and how they're on the way out. You know, in, in the UK, in the early 20th century, um, a, a now very venerable organisation called um, the Classical Association was founded. Um, uh, it was founded because they thought the classics and classics teaching in the UK had no hope of surviving. And this was in something like 1902, a, a period of which we think now, looking back, it was at its most secure and confident. I think that I wouldn't ignore that, though. And I, I, I think that the, the one thing that we really have to resist is the idea, which you find in many governments, that the humanities are nice. You don't, you, you know, you don't not like them. You, you think it's nice that there are people who can tell you about um, Gilgamesh or Jane Austen or whatever. But somehow, when the chips are down, they're not the first call on people on funding. And, and I think that we've been a bit too um, frightened, actually, about that, of saying the humanities are essential for public debate and for understanding the world. And I, I kind of got a line during the pandemic um, when, you know, of course, you know, we were so grateful for the scientists that, who worked on the vaccine. But if you live through a pandemic, you have to understand what living through a pandemic is all about. You don't just need a vaccine. You need some headspace to work out what's going on. And you know, we're better than the ancient world, the ancient classical, European classical world. Go back to you know, what's the earliest surviving work of Greek literature. It's Homer's Iliad. How does Homer's Iliad start? It starts with a plague. It starts with a pandemic. Right. Pandemics and plagues have been part of our cultural world for as far back as we can see. And the past can help you. It doesn't have a simple lesson, but it can help you think about it differently. And in that sense, it is the study of literature, the past, global pasts, they are essential to the flourishing of humanity. They're not just an optional extra if there's enough money for them. What a brilliant note to end. Professor Dame Mary Beard, superstar, thank you very much. Thank you.